the search for life beyond Earth goes into two categories right now. One is solar system bodies, including Mars, um, Jupiter's icy moons, and Saturn's moon Titan and Enceladus, and others. And there's also the search for life beyond our solar system, and that is the search for life on exoplanets, planets that orbit stars other than the Sun. Right now, the search still has a very long way to go, but the reason we're so excited about the search is that for the first time ever in human history, we know that small planets are common. We also know we're actually building the next generation of space telescopes, which we hope we can use to maybe, if we get lucky, find and identify a planet that might be like Earth. My personal speculation is that our universe is teeming with life. The reason I think that is because we know that small planets are very common. Every star has at least one planet, not necessarily a planet like Earth. But if you imagine what the building blocks for planets are, they are out there. Water is very common, ice is very common. And the chance that there's a planet out there that had water delivered to it, that is the right temperature to maintain oceans, in my mind, it's gotta be there somewhere. And the harder part of that speculation is, did life arise elsewhere? But I'll tell you one thing, that astronomers see wherever we look, we see the ingredients for life, building blocks of life, organic material, even amino acids. And that's not to say that whenever they're out there, they join together and make life, but just the fact that the ingredients are so common and planets are so common, and we're bound to have some planets end up with water on them. I think it's out there somewhere. Out of all the methods available to search for exoplanets, I would say two have been most productive. One of them is so-called radial velocity search, or the wobble method, when two planet, a planet is orbiting its star. In fact, the planet and star are orbiting their common center of mass. You can also think of it as the planet tugging on the star, but it's actually more accurate to think of them orbiting each other's common center of mass. But that star is just wobbling a tiny bit, and we can measure the line of sight motion induced by the planet orbiting the star. The second most popular method, which is actually the best one, most prolific method to date, is transit method. In that case, the planet goes in front of the star, as seen from the telescope, and the starlight drops by a tiny amount. And basically, you know what? There are so many, there are many more techniques. Each technique will have its day. And so we expect that other techniques that are just becoming to, the, that are just coming to fruition today will actually reveal a lot of more new interesting planets. There has been great progress with direct imaging. On the ground, the eight meter Gemini South Telescope has GPI, Gemini Planet Imager, and they're now, they've had, been operating for about a year and they're gonna survey stars, not for planets like Earth, but for bigger, hotter planets a little further away from the star. So that is really super taking off. As for going to space, we'd like to go to space to get above the blurring effects of Earth's atmosphere so we can block out starlight and see a very faint planet directly. Did you notice that <laughs> it's a one petal out of what would be about 28 petals, and that's about a two-third scale, and it would be surrounding a 15 or 20 meter diameter hub. So the Starshade has seen a lot of progress recently, mostly technological development in the lab, as well as the science case that we've put together for it. Recently, we have completed an 18-month design study, and the report is actually available online, and especially if you just look at the four-page executive summary, some of it, it's supposed to be not understandable to everybody because it's not really for the general reader, but you could definitely get the gist of what's going on and what has happened. So when, one thing is just for background is that as each technique is successful, there's always a better or slightly different way to <laughs> implement the technique. So the Kepler Space Telescope was wildly successful in pioneering transit search from space. And TESS is like another version of Kepler, but different. Whereas Kepler looked at one field, one part of the sky for four years, and now it's doing other things. TESS will be an all-sky survey to look at stars spread out all around the sky. And the reason for this change in thinking is that we want to find the transiting planets around the bright stars. Brightness, photons, that's our currency. The more photons, the better. We can do more follow-up work, study the planet's orbit more, even study the planet atmosphere itself. But all those bright stars, they're spread all around the sky. And so the TESS space telescope, or the TESS spacecraft, will actually look all around the sky for transiting planets. One important distinction between Kepler and TESS is that Kepler focused on Earth-sized planets around sun-sized stars. 
Tess is less capable than Kepler in many ways, and so it will be able to find Earth-sized planets around small stars in the habitable zone of some of those stars. Okay. In exoplanets, we often separate out discovery of planets from their characterization. So Tess will discover planets. It will find planets, like their addresses, so to speak, the stars that have planets around them. And from that pool, we will draw the very best ones and we'll use the James Webb Space Telescope to look at the planet atmospheres. The James Webb is not good with surveying the whole sky, but if you know where to look and which target is ideal, the James Webb can do the job. Actually, I would have said it differently. I would have said we will have the capability to find and identify life. I don't know if Ellen, for example, Ellen Stofan thought carefully about what she was saying or not. I don't know, but I would have said it very differently. I would have said, you know, within, within, in the next 10 years, we'll have the capability to find and identify planets that might be like Earth and to see signs of life if they are present. And within 30 years, I'll say, um, like, we'll never be, Unfortunately, we will never definitively be able to say if there's life or not, but we could find very strong suggested evidence of life. We'll have the capability to do that. And in 30 years, we hope to have the next telescope even beyond the James Webb Space Telescope, and that that telescope has the capability to find dozens and dozens of Earths and to look at their atmospheres for signs of life in them. So I think that's where the comments come from. Right. And I would try to say a little more carefully. It's definitely bothersome that many gases that life produces are also produced by other means, like geophysics, volcanoes, as you said, atmospheric processes. And so we do have a whole set of gases produced by life that are also produced in other ways. We also have other gases produced in much smaller quantities that aren't produced in other ways. That might be like dimethyl sulfide or methyl chloride or other things, which I'm sure there could be scientists out there who say, oh, I know a way we could make that. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to go gas by gas and assess it based in terms of the environmental context, what likelihood we think it is to be attributed by life. Am I happy with that? No. Do I have a choice? No. <laughs> I'm probably not the only one who really hopes there is life beneath the surface on Mars and that there are these small pockets where life could exist. I really hope they find it. I can't speculate whether or not they actually will, but I believe people will try. Keep trying. The thing I've, just as a little aside, I've always noticed about Mars researchers, even if they don't find signs of life or evidence of life, they will keep looking. And I think they'll just keep looking indefinitely. You don't have that many objects in the solar system where life could exist, and one hopes that humanity finds a way to explore each of them in time. Okay, with SETI, it's one of those experiments that why wouldn't you do it? it would be foolish to not try at all. But SETI faces a number of challenges. When I've heard the SETI folks give talks, they'll say their search so far has been equivalent to one glass of water compared to all of the world's oceans. So they have a long way to go to keep searching. You know, they also rely on this concept that the thought process that the intelligent aliens will communicate at the same frequency that they are listening at. There's also this huge debate in the community of do we send a signal? The answer is usually no, let's not broadcast our existence. But if nobody's sending and they're only listening, we'll never make progress. So I think SETI has a lot of yeah. challenges, but why wouldn't you do SETI? I'm on the fence about this. I feel that if a civilization can come and do harm to us, they already are going to know we're here. They're going to have other ways to find us. So I'm, I'm not worried about that. You know, if we broadcast and they listen and can't do anything, okay, they could send us a message back. But if they actually have the capability to come here and find us, we don't need to broadcast our existence. They'll have other ways to find us. I can definitely justify it. I have to smile first because I get asked this question a lot, so that's why I have a lot of... Um, so, you know, there's several ways to look at this problem. One way is to just acknowledge astronomy is a luxury science and we're just lucky we get to do this at all. A second way is just like great art, great cathedrals, things that we do as a humanity, as a society, who actually can do great things. Should we be building complicated space telescopes? Should we be creating the next, you know, is it something that humanity should do? Do we need to do, have that creative process to be human?
Uh, my favorite reason of why we should justify building these space telescopes is because as a nation, we want to keep ourselves at the edge, at the frontiers of technological innovation. And that is a very hard thing to do. We actually can showcase with the James Webb our capabilities as a nation to the out, outside our country as well as to within. And we can't show off our defense-related technologies. It's just not allowed. And so in, in a lot of other space telescopes and other things are proprietary and they won't give you info. But in this way with something like the James Webb, we can show to the world what we're capable of as a country and that is very powerful. Related is that this actually attracts the next generation to go into science and technology, which we really need to have happen here. So here at MIT, for example, lots of students funnel in and they want to uh, learn about exoplanets, they want to work on test-related projects. They're not all going to be exoplanet scientists. They go off and later on and they work in industry and in aerospace companies and they invent new things and they're our, our generation of the future. So these big things in space um, help inspire the next generation. Um, I'll say one more thing actually, and it's a more kind of cutthroat way of looking at it, is, is a jobs program. I mean we have um, taxpayers' dollars that go to a whole variety of things. And you could say, well why don't we just take this money and have a program so people you know, struggling to get by can get assistance. Or you could say, look, you can have a jobs I know I'll get like flamed for this at some point, but you can have a jobs program, right? And you put the money here. Most of it goes to labor, actually. And that they, those people developing the new materials or assembling the telescope or testing or integrating it or working on the launch, each of them get paid and support other jobs. And those people support other jobs and there's a cascade effect. So in one way, if you said, how is it best to spend this taxpayer's dollars, you may find that it's such a tiny part of the, of the whole overall budget that it's worth supporting. The question of you know, pure scientific research. People don't realize, they, they don't realize that just by, you have to do random things and experiments and observe and explore and build to find something that is truly valuable for humanity. Like people who discovered antibiotics, they weren't looking for it. People who figured out lasers, Albert Einstein came up with the laser concept, but it was decades before it could be implemented. Those of us today, um, not me yet fortunately, who need surgery, you know, laparoscopic surgery, medical techniques, a lot of that comes from just pure research in engineering and even space related things have contributed to that and to medical imaging. When it comes to UFOs, I am a non-believer because I don't believe there are UFOs. I don't believe that it's easy to travel f these large distances. I don't believe that one can travel close to the speed of light. And I haven't seen any evidence that passes any tests at all. And there's a thought, oh, UFO this, UFO that, but it, you know, if there's so many UFOs visiting us all the time, surely some of them would leave some evidence, some scrap of real evidence that could be tested or, or looked at or seen. So I'm an open-minded only in the hopes that someday we will find a way to travel to other stars. But it's not gonna be easy, and I don't think they're continually visiting us and things like that. So I'm a definite non-believer. And just sort of as a little aside, a bit large part of the exoplanet fan base are UFO believers. So I don't give them, you know, I don't believe them, but I don't shun them.